This interview was recorded on January 11th, 2021. Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Bruce Eckel. Based in Crested Butte, Colorado, Bruce is an author of numerous award-winning books, as well as being a consultant, conference organizer, and a popular speaker who has given hundreds of presentations around the world. You can follow him on Twitter at Bruce Eckel and check out his work on his website at bruceeckel.com, as well as his blog at reinventing-business.com and his other sites, wintertechforum.com and myviewllc.com. Along with his colleague, James Ward, Bruce is also co-host of the Happy Path Programming Podcast, which you can find at happypathprogramming.com or, or wherever you find your podcasts. Bruce has published two books on LeanPub on Java 8, and along with his co-author, Svetlana Isakova, Atomic Kotlin. In this interview, we're going to talk about Bruce's background and career, professional interests, his books, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience using LeanPub. So thank you, Bruce, for being on the Front Matter Podcast. My pleasure. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you first became interested in computers and programming. Uh, boy, we could probably, I'm old enough, we could use the whole podcast for my origin story, but <laughs> I'll try and keep it succinct. Um, I grew up in a, a suburb of San Diego, California. And in high school, I think it was my freshman or sophomore year, we had a teacher, a math teacher, who had been um, an engineer, and he had somehow gotten an ASR 33 teletype in the classroom that was connected through, I'm sure it was like a 110 baud modem. So you could like hear the bits as they're going by with a acoustic phone coupler, the, you know, that whole thing. And it was connected to, I believe it was an HP 1000. Anyway, we were able to remotely program in basic and I liked that, but I didn't actually touch computers much until I was in college and um, I studied physics as an undergrad. I, I actually started in journalism for a year, then changed to physics and then added engineering. So, um, and, then, and then did a master's degree in computer engineering. So um, throughout all that, I was dabbling in, you know, computers were becoming more available and even Actually, when I was in grad school, I had a summer job where I was programming an Apple II to print out reports for a water treatment plant. And, you know, so I got, anyway, so a lot of basic and then other languages. Um, and then eventually I, when I graduated, because I basically took a lot of time in college because I didn't want to join the real world and get a job and have somebody to tell me what to do. And so um, I did that for a few years. And then eventually what I always wanted to do was, was somehow break off on my own. And I've been independent ever since. Yeah. And you, you created uh, MindView in 1997? Uh, yeah, I guess probably that. I mean, I was going through different companies and company names. I thought it was before that, but um, I, I don't actually remember. I was, uh, I became independent when I was, I mean, I think it must have been the early, late 80s or early 90s, something like that. I had started writing books and then one, I think it was the first actual book contract that I got. I thought, oh, you know, I'll try and spend all my time doing this. And I think that's when I quit my job. And yeah. It's interesting. The, uh, the notion of not liking being told what to do uh, and going independent is something that's come up many times on this podcast. I don't know if there's something about being an author, like people who are, you know, drawn to writing books and doing long projects like that and independence or something like that. But that move to going independent is something that um, a lot of a lot of lean pub authors have made in their in their careers. Uh, I was wondering, when did you get into book pub, book writing and book publishing? Okay, so my first book I published when I was 30, so that was 33 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But before that, I had started writing for a magazine that was published out of Bend, Oregon, called Micro Cornucopia, and I became a columnist there. And then what my first book was, was basically a collection of my columns. It's called Computer Interfacing with Pascal and C. So I, I was trying... 
I was basically, my interest was in trying to use high level languages to interface with computers, which at the time people used assembly language to interface to the outside world. And um, there were a lot of people, I think, requesting reprints of articles or something like that. And so I thought, oh, I'll turn it into a book. And my friend Daniel had just written a book and we met when we were 11 and we were not competitive, but it was more like if he did something, then I would do it or vice versa. So we and and it was kind of like, oh, well, if Daniel can write a book, then I must be able to write a book, too. Plus, you know, I'd had enough background, et cetera. And, and it was just a matter of massaging the material together. So it was a very kind of slow, stepwise process to go from, you know, first you write articles and then you write books. And the thing is, kind of, I guess, sort of ironic was that the reason I started writing articles and then writing books was I thought it would be a good way to promote my consulting services. But then it's sort of, you know, in hindsight, I realized that, yeah, if you want to be a consultant, talk to successful consultants and find out how they get their jobs. Don't make up a story in your head that, oh, writing for magazines and writing books will bring consulting clients in. And I would get them and it was probably the you know, the right number for me and the right frequency, but it wasn't like if if you're serious about wanting to be a consultant, don't imagine that, oh, this path or that path is the right way to go. Like do some research, some serious research, which I didn't do. I was just going, ah, this will work for sure. Yeah, it's funny. Um, uh, you know, in the, in the stories of people who've achieved some success in life, there's often they had what what I, I sometimes heard people jokingly refer to as a rabbi. But, you know, if you like go ask people who've done what you want to do, how they did it doesn't mean copy them. If they tell you to copy them, keep keep looking for someone else to help help mentor you. But, um, uh, you know, uh, that idea that like, you know, really other people are a resource. And, and the other thing is that they often are happy to share with someone who they see as like-minded and going along the path. So, you know, if you're listening to this and you're thinking of going independent, you know, these, this is all really, really great advice. Um, uh, and so um, your, I think your first sort of award-winning book was thinking in C++. Mm-hmm. What was it? I think for all the budding authors listening to the podcast, what was it like when the book started to get attention? Well, okay. So that is, that's an important question, but the way I'm going to answer it isn't going to be what you want. What I have done with a lot of things is, and in particular when it comes to books, is I don't really want to... I've known people who've actually written bots to let them know when their book has reached a certain level uh, on Amazon or something. And it's like that kind of repulses me. I don't want, the Buddha said that all suffering comes from attachment to outcome. And it's like, that's totally attachment to outcome. Um, After all these years, I do find myself getting a little sucked into the emails that I get from lean pub when I sell a book and it's like, yeah. And, and I totally see how people could get completely drawn into that, but I don't think that's, I I feel like what you want to do is focus. Okay. So when I was writing thinking in Java at the time I started writing it, there were hundreds of, I mean, people had just flooded the market with Java books. There was like, I don't know, 400 of them out there. And so I had people very seriously tell me that I was wasting my time, that the niche had been filled, that, you know, there was no way that I was going to make any headway in the Java book field. And, um, I didn't pay attention because I wasn't really trying to do that. I was just trying to write the book the way that I wanted to make it. And by that time I had taken over the publishing process with thinking in C++. I was giving the publisher both camera ready pages and a um, 
cover. So I was designing everything because my experience with publishers is that they would just half-ass everything. Like when, when they would, I mean, these are professional publishers. When they would send me galleys and I would mark up the galleys. Okay, just a little history. They used to send you these big, you know, sheaves of paper that you would have to go through. And those are called galleys. Those are, you know, and, and so you go through and you mark them up by hand. And then they'd send me another set of galleys. And not only had they not fixed some portion of the exercise of the um, corrections that I made, they would have introduced new new errors into the book. And it's just like, okay, this is your job and you're not doing it right. So I started taking it over. And for both thinking in C++ and thinking in Java, to get both camera ready pages and an index and to be able to fix it at any time because a lot of people said oh you should use a page layout program but once you lay out the pages you're stuck with them you know you can't do any of the stuff that i was doing so um boy i'm sorry i totally lost the thread of your uh question what, what was the original question oh i, I was asking about what I, I was no no that was that was that's a great answer well, I mean, what does it feel like what does it feel like and then you, you you gave a really good answer about you know it's it's important not to be too preoccupied with outcome particularly precise outcome it's, it's interesting you reminded me of an interview i did with someone maybe last year who he he was a self-published author he'd have he'd had a fair amount of success with that and um but he'd also become quite popular on twitter Mm -hmm. And he had experience, he'd had a very bad experience ultimately because he became kind of addicted to like tweeting and then watching the retweets and the, and, and the replies and the likes come in. And he, he found he, he did what he realized after a while was like, well, what am I doing this? Like, not that he, I should stop doing whatever I'm doing completely, but I've transformed it from a way of communicating with people and having fun and stuff like that into something where like, I'm just, all I'm concerned about is what the react, how many reactions I get. And so that preoccupation with outcome can actually become like the preoccupation itself becomes a substitute for what the initial outcome you were aiming for really was, uh, which is one of the, the reasons that I, yeah, I, I completely agree that sort of, I mean, focusing on the outcome too much can actually become its own sort of different kind of problem. But what you were saying also about, about publishers, I mean, we've heard over the years, we've heard from lots of people on LeanPub who've come, come to us from publishers where often they've had a similar experience. And almost always what people say is, the people I worked with at the publishing company were fantastic, but there were problems with the processes that the people I worked with didn't have any authority to improve. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of those things, they were probably rushed or, well, I, I remember realizing that um, the indexes were created by probably some English major that they'd hired off the street and they've said, we'll give you a flat fee. So basically do it as fast as you can. Don't, don't worry about quality or anything like that. Just the, and so the indexes were terrible. And that was one of the other reasons that I took over. I th because if I'm going to do an index, I, you know, I'm going to have to do it myself because nobody else cares about it that much. Plus they would charge you, they would charge you to to do that indexing, that very bad indexing. So it was insult to injury completely. Yeah, it's, I could talk about this forever, but it's, it's an interesting feature of the publishing world that because books are involved, it often, often people feel like the appropriate person to do certain tasks is someone who's not very technical. <sighs> You know, and and so I've I've, I've like I've, I've actually seen like a, a a version of what you're describing before. Now, as a, as a former English major who became an investment banker, you know, I'm not disparaging English majors here or their capacity to learn technical things, but often often in publishing houses, you can get people put in roles where the, the decents don't have the necessarily the right mindset for the like boring detailed work that they might be given. You know. Well, and with my, I don't know, I guess I studied it for about 10 years on and off of organizational structures. The fact that publishing is one of the oldest surviving industries out there and how it, it has accreted all of the cruft that you get with the hierarchical organization 
it's not surprising at all. And what, the deeper that you go into publishing, I mean, the, the numbers that I've always heard is that about 10% of the books break even and about 1% are actually profitable, which if you think about it, that puts all of the weight of the success of the company on that 1%. And they don't try to figure out how to create better books. What they do instead is, well, if 1% is the number, we'll just put out more books. And they don't, you know, and even O'Reilly, um, which started out by saying, oh, let's put out quality books. I remember, I think it was a presentation or, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a presentation that Tim O'Reilly gave at some conference that I was at. And the way I translated it in my head is that he had fallen victim to the whispering of the MBA in his ear. And, he, and you know, that's the moment when O'Reilly started to decline and they've been trying to climb back up, but they were at the top. You, I don't know if you remember this idea that it's an O'Reilly book, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to ask anymore. That's the book that you want to get. But then, boy, they took a tumble because they just, they were thinking, well, we can make more money or maybe they're publicly held. I don't even know if they're publicly held, but, you know, we got to make more money for the shareholders. So we'll reduce the quality of our product. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that. Um, you reminded me of a little joke I have about uh, the, the vanilla MBA. Uh, so not not to disparage any MBAs out there, there. There's lots of variety in the MBA world, but there's like... I, I don't what, disparage the people, I disparage the programs. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I totally understand. <laughs> and I remember one time I uh, signed up for a newsletter for a sports apparel company where I live. And, um, you know, I didn't like the newsletter, so I said unsubscribe and I got a message saying you will be unsubscribed after 14 days and I knew uh, well, well you I, can't do it instantly well no, well I knew I knew exactly why it was that number because Canada had recently passed something called the um, Canadian anti-spam legislation which gave you up to 14 days before you 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 could you know you could suffer a penalty for not unsubscribing someone for a list so somebody with what i describe as the vanilla mba mindset would have seen that go aha we can keep it for 14 days of course they lost a customer for life uh and you know i tell everybody i can not to go to that place not that that matters but you know what i mean right there's often people think that think that they're kind of making the right move when they're losing sight of the bigger picture right ultimately I think what annoys me about so many of the business programs and business books and all that is that it's not that, I mean, they're trying to turn a, something into a formula, which is what you want to do and what people want is connection. And so a genuine connection with the customer. And I, when I'm writing books, I don't know how this happened, but I'm always imagining myself speaking to an audience. And I have spoken to lots of audiences all over, but this was even before then. It was always, and it, and it wasn't like I, I set myself to think that way. It was just, that was the picture in my mind. And so it's kind of, how is this working? You're serving the audience. That's, and so many people don't understand that your job is to serve the reader. And that means, you know, and I have trouble with this too. Sometimes I like to, I feel flowery. And so I'll write flowery prose and then I'll go back and I'll see, okay, yeah, this is maybe kind of cute or whatever, but does it help the reader? And usually the result is chopping the sentence down or taking it out altogether if it's if it doesn't move the story forward all of these things always thinking in terms of what is serving the reader and um and it's a very different mindset and if you're i guess it goes back to your previous question if what you're interested in is that the roller coaster ride of maybe having well you won't get that success unless you connect with the reader it's it's really got to be your first and foremost thought well and uh, i mean speaking of management connecting with your employees 
as well. Um, uh, they're the people who who make everything that you make or provide every service that you provide. And um, I think we'll actually get an opportunity to circle back around to that subject because I, I I've learned when I was researching for this this podcast that you have an interest in you know, business organization theory and, and stuff like that. And I want to ask you eventually about, about remote work. Um, yes. But before we do that, one thing I introduced into this podcast, I think way back in March was a question. How has uh, I get one of the, pleasures of this podcast is getting to talk to people from different places all around the world. And so I started asking people, what's it been like? What's the pandemic experience been like for you where you are? And that could have been London. It could have been Seattle. It could have been San Francisco. It could have been, uh, you know, any number of other places. Uh, you live in a very beautiful place called Crested Butte, uh, which is sort of, I guess, you know, remote in the mountains as I gather and stuff like that. What's, what's the experience for you been like, been like, uh, you know, sort of personally just go around town and, and then I'm going to ask you actually how it's affected you professionally as well, if you don't mind talking about that. So, well, we're a tourist town. It's a ski resort. And uh, for the last, I don't know, 15 years or something, I've been, originally it was called the Java Posse Roundup because the Java Posse was a group of podcasters in the early days of Java who were very popular. And they interviewed me and I, and I talked about having discovered different ways to do conferences, the idea of an open spaces conference. And then they said, hey, how about if you organize a conference for us? So we started doing that. And it's always happened in the winter. And and so when they dissolved, um, we uh, renamed it to the Winter Tech Forum, uh, WTF for short, and um, and have continued doing it. And we had the the conference like it ended up. I mean, of course, plan it you know six months or so in advance, and it ended up being like right near when everything started to shut down. Everyone, everyone was up here. Um, and because it's a tourist town, we had a lot of people coming in. And basically, as far as I can tell, everybody in town got exposed. And so we had, and we had three people, well, let's see, we had two people from the conference. And then um, my friend Carl, who was one of the Java Posse guys, he died. And um, that was hard. And I was having the disease myself while, when this came through. And it does all kinds of things to you, including your, um, your uh, well, they, they say maybe it's, you know, nervous system anyway. It messes with your emotions and all this kind of stuff. So it was, it was very rough. But we haven't really had any resurgence since then. And, the, of course, the trickiness of the disease is that some people have have mild symptoms and may not even know that they have it. So we have a whole town full of people who are going, it seems like I would have been exposed, but I didn't have the symptoms. And then there are people like me and one of my neighbors. And it's like, yeah, we definitely had it. You know, we just, we had all the symptoms. Um, and so we've been, I mean, I think that's the reason that, that we haven't gotten re-shut down in this area is because most people got exposed and we haven't, so we haven't had much of a resurgence. And so we've had, I mean, not a, you know, we've been careful about tourism, but we've had a fair amount of tourists coming through since then. And um, it hasn't caused a resurgence. So I'm guessing that's why I think, but we don't know, you know, we can't tell if that's the thing. You, if, even if you've had it, you can't be sure you read articles one way or the other. And, and it's like some one day they're saying, yep, looks like it's, you know, you're good once you've had it. And then others go, well, you don't know, maybe you could get it again. Hard to say. So it's been we one of the things that we did, which is good, is that um, the main street downtown, they turned it into a one way street up the middle and then they put tables outside so that people could be outside and that the restaurants could survive because we've had a few go out of business. And um, also, it kind of gave the place more of a festival atmosphere. So they're talking about making it a permanent thing in the summer, which I'm all for. So, um, yeah, that's been what it's that's going to be what it's like. Is it affected my business? 
I, I'm not a good metric for that because my business goes all over the place. You know, sometimes I'm traveling a lot and speaking and consulting and things and other times it's quiet and I'm just working on a project like this. I would say that um, having a book to work on, a project to work on has been really good because while I'm working on it, I feel pretty normal, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. Sure. Um, uh, I really appreciate that. It's um, it's interesting. You're the second person uh, I've interviewed who contracted the virus. Uh, mm-hmm. I've interviewed people who, um, you know, were exposed in the early days and then had to live for two weeks in their basement with their, you know, spouses and children kind of prison style sliding, sliding food under the door and stuff like that. And then there's the, you know, there's the sort of sort of funny aspects of it like that. But there's also the sitting there for two weeks, wondering if you've got it. And if, if you've spread it to your family or your friends or your colleagues and things like that. And it's a different experience for everyone. Um, uh, I live in a, a tourist city myself <laughs> and um, in Victoria, British Columbia. And, oh, yeah. Uh, been there yeah yeah and, uh, and um yeah it's uh it's it's been difficult for the economy here uh but one one thing that's happened here like has happened in many other places too is yeah the, the main the kind of main drag they uh they turned off if effectively it was kind of three lanes wide and they turned off two of them and turned them into um uh, yeah, places for restaurants to have tables out. This is a change that people really like. There was actually, they painted on the middle of the street a little symbol of a person with a circle around it, but no strike through, indicating mm-hmm. that that this is for walking now, uh, not oh. for cars. Uh, and um, and so, like, you can, still, you can still thread the bollards kind of thing, but they very deliberately said, like, this is a space for walking now. And it's something that, in my experience... Tourists love it when they can just walk around without having to dodge death, you know. Uh, I wish we had gone that far, but we have, there are some folks with businesses that just resist any kind of change. And um, and it would have been great if it could have just become a walking. I mean, that's what most people would love, but... Yeah, the Champs Elysees might uh, go down that path. Actually, in Paris, I just read an article the other day. It's it's really exciting. And on, on that note, actually, I wanted to ask you. So I thought I said I'd circle back to remote work. Um, and so, uh, as someone who's interested in you know organizational uh, structure and design and things like that, um, do you think that the shift to remote work that's happened for so many people? during the pandemic is going to be something that gen- generally persists across various different industries? Um, well, I mean, just the foundational piece is before there were lots of people who would say, oh, no, I, you know, this can't work unless I have my eyes on you, you know, that old management style thinking. And they can't say that anymore, you know, because obviously it does work. And it's it's certainly possible and, you know, productivity doesn't plummet or anything. I have friends here who always have worked remote and as, as programmers worked remotely. And I've had a small consulting firm with a couple of recent graduates and they've just been remote. I mean, one of them just goes from one place to another whenever he feels the desire and just is used to working remotely. And so it's, um, I mean, it sure has changed things. And especially in a field like programming where it's hard to get people in the first place, it's just a lot harder to make the argument that I, if you make that argument, like me, I don't want to work for you if you're making that argument. If you say, hey, sometimes we'll have meetings in the office and you'll get to meet people and hang out. And it's like, that attracts me. But if you say, oh, no, you have to be here. Otherwise, I can't know if you're working or not. Like, yeah, you're not the person I want to be working for. Yeah, I think, thank you for touching on that. I think that's that's one of the, one of the, um, most important points that there's a certain type of person who sort of has a certain type of management style or theory is having a hard time facing, which is that it's actually going to be a way of competing for talent uh, to provide remote work. Um, and that the most talented, most productive people are going to want some kind of 
uh, remote work setup probably and and a lot of that too is because a lot of people didn't didn't know uh, that the tools work now right because they were used to you know I always unfortunately I pick on WebEx and stuff like that but you know a lot of people didn't know that like Zoom works um, that you can I mean you can take over other people's computers and 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 do stuff on them now like it's just this sort of total it's like standing over their keyboard or whatever at their desk like these things just work now. I had a friend who's... Which know, we've been able to do for a long time, but now it's in the general, you know, knowledge sphere, whereas before it was just special. Because my brother has been remote taking care of people's computers for years, mm-hmm. and he just controls them all remotely and virtually never has to go out to on site so the tools have been there but now everybody knows about it yeah now everybody knows but i had a friend who's a who's a sort of relatively prominent lawyer who's like did you know you can just conference people into video calls and it just works <laughs> like yeah i'm so glad to hear you figured that out because and now and now he gets to spend way more time uh with his kids and his family and he gets way more work done and he's got more work to do than ever uh and it's partly because he's more productive the way he's doing it now my my pet theory is that you know if someone's if a company starts forcing people back to work and they're going to be like having to get up at a particular time, get on mute. Commu- yeah. That commute. And it's just going to feel so arbitrary and capricious that, um, and then, and then like, of course, what's going to happen in the end is you're just, you're just going to get to your desk and sit in front of a computer, which you probably brought with you from home now and just do what you could have done without wasting all that time. And there's an there. old, um, Disney animation of what the future is going to be like. And I don't know, it was probably from the sixties or something. And, you know, you're watching the, the male wage earner. Cause he's, you know, the, the woman is off shopping and doing woman things. Right. So, you know, back then that's, that's the way they were mindset was. And um, so anyway, the guy gets up, gets on a train, you know, gets all the way into work, sits at a desk with all of these things. And then when his boss wants to talk to him, his boss talks to him through a monitor and you're, and you're watching this and going, you were so close. You were almost there, but you, you just you couldn't even question the idea that you had to commute in. And I think that goes back to, um, I think it was Adam Smith who was the one who said, well, if, if, I, I'm pretty sure he's the one that say people are lazy and they'll steal. And and then later in the book, he he refutes that. So but people immediately grabbed onto that thing. Oh, it's simple. Got to got to have eyes on them all the time or else they'll they'll steal from us. Yeah, I could I could talk about that that forever. Um, that that actually in particular, the idea of, of vision and being able to see. Uh, is is a really deep part of it, um, uh, and um, the image I like to say is where it, where it comes from is like old old salt mines, um, <laughs> where there'd be like somebody at the bottom, some guys toiling in the sort of bottom, and then there'd be someone one level up looking down on them, making sure they're doing their job, and then up on the next level above in the salt the step salt mine would be someone not just looking at the people working, but looking at the people looking at the people working below them, and then you can imagine going all the way to the top, and then this idea that if you can't see it, there's almost this this con- this preoccupation that if you can't see it, it can't be happening, uh, which which makes programming a difficult kind of work for people like that to wrap their heads around, right? Or even intellectual work, right? Because as my brother likes to joke, like a guy just resting his hands, his head on his hands might be doing the hardest work he's ever done in his life, but you can't see it. And so a lot of people just don't believe it and don't even think of it as work. Well, programming is typing. So right. the faster you type, the faster you're programming. Yeah. Um, you might want to change your um, analogy there because it turned out that a job in the salt mines was actually a cush gig. Really? That's, you wanted the – yeah. I when, One of the times – I mean, this has been one of the great things about um, – writing books, I guess, is that I get invited to other countries. Anyway, um, this was in Poland. And I've been to Poland a number of times, wonderful place. And um, they, one of the trips, they took me to visit, they have these salt mines, and you go in and there's sculptures and everything. And you start hearing the background of it. And it's like, oh, yeah, the job in the salt mine is the one you want, especially in the summertime, because it's really cool down there. And yeah, they, they had a good deal in the salt even though 
you always hear that, oh, well, back to the salt mines, like that's your drudgery, but that it is, wasn't. That is really fascinating. <laughs> Thank it, you yeah, I know. I, I love things where we have this um, kind of common knowledge and then you discover that it's totally wrong. For some reason, I find a lot of satisfaction out of discovering those things. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, on that note, not to digress too much, but Adam Smith's concept of the invisible hand is an example of that. Um, uh, if you want to know what he really meant, Google Noam Chomsky invisible hand and then you'll, 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 find, you'll find a pretty good good article mm. uh and I, was, I wasn't speaking to you i was speaking to the, the audience sure that, but, but it's a uh, it's basically basically one one version i mean it's always it's always more complicated than you think right but like one version one way a quick way of explaining what it really means is that people's national nationalist interests would mm-hmm. override their capitalist interests in certain circumstances and that that's what the invisible hand was it wasn't that the market's just going to like naturally optimize it was actually that people would would violate the sort of normal rules of capitalist trade and and motives in or in order to pursue nationalist motives. Hmm. That there were circumstances under which that would occur. That's my understanding. Okay. Um, but anyway, we can all go all go look into it later. Yeah. Um, uh, so actually, one thing, just as a bit of a segue into the next part of the. Uh, interview where we talk about your books so you you've 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 written books you these books mostly have a pedagogical kind of like purpose for them they're trying to teach people things and you mentioned at the beginning that you know you started out in journalism and university went into physics and then did a i believe a master's in computer engineering um if you were starting out now with all of the books and online resources and things like that available with the intention of having a career as a programmer would you go to university university and formally study computer science or computer engineering or would you maybe take a different different path do you think oh boy that's a tough one so when i was going to school it was you could go to school for effectively no money well i guess you're in canada so isn't it more or less the same thing it's 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 much cheaper than it is in the united states right yeah. so like the university of california I think first started having some fees when I was there and people were reacting to, you know, it's just going to cost us $90 a, a, a semester or a term or whatever, you know, they were just, and of course now all the colleges are crazy uh, expensive. But at the time I really, I had had some jobs. Actually, my father was in construction. And so some of my first jobs were like, cleaning out ditches and doing really miserable work. And his, his foreman would say, well, we're giving you all the bad jobs so that you don't go into this business. And it worked really well. I didn't want to really go into anything because all work seemed kind of miserable to me. So I was in college to try and avoid that. So I was an undergraduate for like six years because I, let's see, journalism, four years of physics, and then I started adding engineering stuff on top of it. And then I was in graduate school for a couple of years, and I even started a PhD program at UCLA, which fortunately got uh, canceled in my first term because I needed to be booted out, uh, because otherwise, who knows, I probably just would have kept going. Um, But I was avoiding joining the quote-unquote real world. And... um, so, I mean, put that, and I was taking all kinds of other classes too, a lot of art classes and, um, you know, just whatever was interesting to me. I was just trying to get away with not becoming a responsible adult. And uh, so, like, that was really, I really enjoyed being in school. So, that part I wouldn't want to miss out on. But if you're just being practical, I mean, my gosh, the number of things that I learn from watching YouTube videos now, like I just do it more and more. <laughs> and because basically all the lectures from, if you, you're nuts if you don't put all your lectures from your conference on YouTube. And so they're all up there and you can, if you find them, you know, they're, like that's the best way to see a lecture if you start to fall asleep you can pause it and come back to it if you lose interest or anything like that so it's like man that's a huge resource um the 
I mean, the internet, I've, I've gotten rid of a ton of my books. I used to have, I mean, I, it still looks like I've got a lot of books, but I've gotten rid of a ton of them because I realized I don't use them. I'm not, you know, it's rare that a book is for programming it, most of the ones that I had originally was for hunting through to find solutions to answers. The only books that I have now are the ones that have a certain, um, I guess you could say narrative to them. You know, in other words, it's going to carry you through from beginning to it's what I'm trying to write something where you want to read it from cover to cover. And there's not that many of those. And so, um, I don't know. And it's so expensive to go to college. So I would kind of, I would say for sure, look seriously at alternatives because, and even if you do like the two guys that are working for this little consulting firm that we put together, they came out of college and they hadn't been exposed to, to um, get. And of course now they're, you know, they use it all the time and are going, yeah, why didn't, why weren't they teaching that in college? I mean, some sort of distributed version control, it sounds very practical. And so a lot of colleges are wanting to teach theoretical stuff, but you know, I mean, it's actually a pretty mind. I've been kind of struggling to understand how is Git working? Why was it doing all these things? And then there's all kinds of different ways that you can use it. And it's like, no, this is a whole, this is almost like a programming language in itself. This is definitely something that should be taught in school. And a lot of them still aren't. A lot of schools are still teaching Java as their, like, you know, they decided, oh, we can just choose this one language and teach it all the way through. Well, you're kind of crippling people by not teaching them multiple languages at least another one it's it's really you're reminding me it's really interesting i once interviewed someone for the podcast who uh was not just a computer science professor but like had a role in the united states but he had a role in sort of shaping um policy around uh what was being taught in computer science courses around the country and he he compared git to the moment when um surgeons realized they needed to wash their hands and so it, it's a Excellent really useful, example. It's a useful analogy because, like, of course, you've got to understand all the fancy doctor surgeon theory stuff. But one thing that's a very important part of what you learn is just how to scrub up um, and like, you know, holding your hands in the air or whatever, um, uh, you know, as, as, as practical or trivial as it might seem, actually learning those techniques, learning why they work and how they work is just crucial to getting anything done, done properly. Um, yeah, thank you very much for answering that. Yeah, uh, I, I ask that of almost everybody who's got a background in, in computer science, uh, you know, when they come on the podcast. I also ask people who went the other way if they regretted not going to university and stuff like that. And it's, it's always interesting to hear people's perspectives on it. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, I mean, because I had a friend, we did a lot of things together and he had dropped out of college, but I think he had been studying music and he played in bands and things like that. And then he got involved with um, C Sharp and C++ and C Sharp. Anyway, we did a lot of speaking together, but Richard, I think was always kind of embarrassed that he didn't finish college and i'm going you're teaching people who have grad graduate degrees why and but no that couldn't sh couldn't shake it and i think a lot of it is because we go oh well you have to have degrees and you have to have these certifications that are granted you by society in order to make you a legitimate person and uh, gosh that's that's, that's a lot of cultural baggage. And the thing is, some of the best programmers I've ever seen have not had backgrounds in computer science. They've, I mean, sometimes they, like physicists, I mean, yeah, I was a physicist, but I mean, I do find physicists make really good programmers because they're used to struggling with difficult things and, you know, being methodical and that, that was their training. But then there's a lot of musicians turn out to be kind of good, well, like Richard was. And, um, uh, and, and I had another, other friends who are musicians, and I think they understand this idea, you know, maybe the processor makes sense to them, the cadence of, you know, stepping through the T states or something like that. I, I don't know, but for some reason they, you know, reading music is like reading source code. I, I have no idea why, but, you know, so these boxes and we, I, despite the, 
supposed rise of no code programming, I think that's probably going to drive even more demand for programmers, not less, because uh, people are going to be building things and then they need more help beyond what the no code platform is able to give them. And so, yeah. Anyway, next question. Yeah. So, yeah. No, thanks. Uh, moving. Yeah. So moving on to the subject of your book, Atomic Kotlin. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, well, let's just begin with, I mean, and I know this is a big subject that you know a great deal about, but what is Kotlin? So Kotlin is, well, one way to look at it is that it's an object functional hybrid language. And that means it supports both object oriented programming and functional programming. Um, but another way to look at it, which I'm kind of fond of, because I study programming languages, that's kind of my deal and my, my specialty is pre predominantly in looking at languages and comparing them and seeing what works and what doesn't. And what I love about what they did in Kotlin is that they said, um, let's, instead of inventing new things, let's look at the best things that have worked in all the other languages. And I think they had a particular advantage at JetBrains because they were making this, these um, development tools, you know, IntelliJ IDEA supports all these different languages. And, and then they have sometimes, you know, separate, separate tools like PyCharm and stuff. And anyway, they've, they've like dug into the details of all of these languages and they're comparing them consciously or unconsciously. And so I think they were in a really good position to, um, to create a language themselves. And, but their attitude of, well, we know all these other languages and we see what works and what doesn't. Let's just find the things that work best and put them together in a language. And so it's extremely well thought out. And if you go back and look at how Java was put together, it was, I mean, the initial version of Java was put together in a real hurry. And they threw things in there that years later they had to like withdraw from the language, deprecate and everything. So um, to see a language which is so thoughtfully created in contrast is just a delight. And they thought, you know, it's, it's every detail. Like they, uh, I don't know, for example, Java mindlessly adopted the new keyword from C++. And in C++, it was essential. In Java, it wasn't because they're using a garbage collector. And in Kotlin, like in Python, they don't have a new keyword because you don't need it. It's an extra noise. And, and there's so much in Kotlin that the, the noise has removed. And so it's a lot easier to, I don't know, it's just elegant and clean and I could, I mean, I believe that it will, because Java can only fix itself so far and, and there seems that you experience with those fixes. And so more and more people, I think, are going to move to Kotlin. It solves a bunch of problems that Java just wasn't designed to solve. I don't know if that's... Oh, yeah, no, that's a great answer. And I should, I should mention that there's a really fascinating section at the beginning of the, of the book where you actually go through the kind of history of languages that led up to the development of Kotlin, uh, which is really informative um, and just a great, a great primer for anyone who's interested in the history of, of programming languages just in itself as a subject. I'm glad you like that because that was something we didn't have that. And that was something, I don't know, we added in the last five or six months. And Svetlana said, oh, we got some response from uh, a reader who said, oh, why should I use this language? And so I spent quite a while creating that, um, that particular, well, we call them Adams, but that, that one was more of a chapter. Yeah, but I'm no, glad I, you like it. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I mean, it's just the way my mind works. Like I, 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 like, I mean, there's circumstances in which it's really enjoyable to, enjoyable to just be floating free and trying to like achieve some goals and that can be really exciting. But if you have the, if you're going to be doing something long term and it's very important, having an actual kind of like foundation, which involves not just theory, but the history of the development of that theory. Even if you're going to be doing something for years, take just taking a day <laughs> to think about these things can actually like make a huge difference. Um, and I, I actually wanted to take an opportunity to ask you uh, about a very specific 
uh, decision that was made in Kotlin, one of these deep decisions, which, which is around the issue of indicating no value, which will maybe give you a bit of an opportunity uh, if you're up for it to show people, you know, the importance of what we were just just talking about. Yeah. Well, so, um, gosh, where to where to attack that one? So, yeah. So this is the problem when you go way back memory was super expensive and so people would do things to um to conserve memory because they just didn't have that much of it and that has affected that is still affecting programming language design you know now even though we have tons of memory and we don't need to conserve it um and there are reasons not to conserve it because for example if you use um invariance instead of variables because the only reason to use a variable is to conserve memory you can always do something using invariance and then if it's invariant like if you're using concurrency you never have to worry about locking that memory because it's never going to change and um and so that's huge for safety um so one of the problems with this is you would write a function and you would say, well, the function is supposed to return an int, so I will re, you know, I will only do that. In fact, this kind of gave rise to James and I's, the name of our podcast, which is Happy Path Programming, because that's, you know, the happy path as you go, ah, everything will always be okay. I don't have to worry about something going wrong. But for example, suppose, I mean, a common case is suppose you have a map a hash table uh, associative array those are all the same meaning and you want to look something up in that associative array well there might not be a value for what you're trying to look up if you're you know say you got a dictionary a physical dictionary and you're looking up a word that isn't in the dictionary so you have a function that says look up this word what if there's nothing there so this is the concept of it's not that you've given it the wrong input because it's okay to ask for something that isn't there it's it's not an error but there's nothing there and so you have to have a way to represent that and it turns out there's a lot of situations where um you could throw an exception or somehow report error reporting. The more that I study it, and it's it's actually a, an interesting subject to me as I unravel it, but the more I study it, the more I go, wow, this is a deep topic. And it's another thing which often isn't taught in school. And um, so one of the things that you can do is to say, okay, I'll return a meaningless value and this has often been um, null this is the billion dollar mistake the problem is that there's different ways to get null a and there are things if you're dealing with C++ and you have pointers you can have a null pointer and if you dereference that you're pointing someplace inappropriate anyway it's a big mess but you can also use null, which is the way Kotlin does it. You can use null to represent no value, but not in a way that is going to, um, right? Or I guess I should say you can architect your libraries in such a way that each library can accept that no value and go, oh, that's no value, I'll return no value. And it's a way to handle this situation without throwing exceptions. See, because what Java decided to do was just say, oh, if we ever try and use a null, we'll just throw an exception. And you don't know where it came from usually, and you don't know what it means. It's not very informative. Whereas what Kotlin does is it says, okay, we're going to use, there, there's another alternative which we're going to be expressing in the Scala book, which is the idea of a monad, which a lot of people, and myself included, get like freaked out when they hear about it because it's like, I don't understand what a monad is. Monad is a little package that carries information, and that information could can be the information you're looking for or if something doesn't work right, some additional information. And that's all it is. It's just a package. And people have not been able to explain that for 
way too long. So if one of the things that you can do is to say, okay, I'll return a monad and it'll have my information or it'll have error information. And then the next function along the line can take that and unpack it and decide what to do. And um, so the null is kind of a, uh, there's a word for it. The, the, anyways, the super simple case of a monad. It says, oh, you can have information or you can have a null and it's all in this one package. It's it's simplified because you go, oh, I'm going to return an int. And then if your function returns a null, it's like, oh, that's the other case. Um, and so it's a way to uh, pass the information without throwing an exception to be able to, because that's really should be treated as a normal programming case. Anyway, there's, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff that you can go into. I gave a presentation at one of the Python conferences on error handling, and now I've looked back on it and it's a little embarrassing because I go, oh, I know, I understand this topic so much better now, and I'll probably try and give another presentation at some point where I try and go into it deeply enough. It's, it's a, it's kind of a big topic. It's way bigger than I ever thought. When I first encountered like somebody's C library, I, yeah, the idea of thinking about, I just assumed that when I called this thing, everything would work right. But I was young, so. <laughs> um, thanks very much for that. Uh, one thing I should I should mention, um, lest lest people get the wrong impression of the book, Atomic Kotlin is actually meant for beginners. Um, and and Bruce and and uh, the Svetlana, Svetlana um, do a really good job building things up. Uh, and and as the you know the title implies, they've introduced this idea of, of atoms. So these little little units of learning uh, that that are built up upon. Uh, very systematically throughout the book, and so, you know, if 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 you found Bruce's explanation of this sort of deep computer science and its history kind of intimidating, it won't be intimidating if you read the book, uh, because uh, you'll you'll get it. It's all explained very well, and and put and like I said before, like it's put in context, which is which really helps people to understand things. I also wanted to thank you for uh, diving in and explaining what a monad is. Um, I've had a number of people on the podcast in the past where I challenged them with that, and then everybody responds in a different way. I think the most recent was um chris penner who described it as a semicolon um uh he went in and explained the analogy uh yes. but but that i found that one to be uh maybe a little bit bit more informative than the burrito the burrito one that people often use <laughs> as a yeah joke. which is pointless because yeah it doesn't really matter it's like it's it's a package if you want to call that package a burrito that's doesn't help anything mm -hmm. and yeah but when i first saw the burrito analogy it just confused me even more i i didn't i, I feel like i've only started to grasp it in the last six months or so yeah, yeah. but anyway thank you for uh clarifying that yeah we so we started the atomic um concept with the previous book which was atomic scala and my co-author diane marsh and i wanted to uh, i had taught from both thinking in C++ and thinking in Java, which were really initially um, kind of class notes for a seminar. And the chat, so I was, I had these chapters on one topic and I would lecture through the chapter and it was almost always at least an hour of lecturing and that's way too long and people would lose track, I would lose track. And so what I thought, for for the atomic idea was that well i'd like something where the lecture was five or ten minutes long and then we do exercises because that's where people get value and so that kind of is how it developed and then then um jet brains asked me to write a book just like that but for for kotlin and that was i don't know how many years ago that was and anyway the book took three and a half years to to do. And yep. Well, that, that gives us a great opportunity to segue into the final part of the interview where we talk about your experience as an author and how you approach book writing and, and things like that. Uh, and I wanted to, I always start this, this section by asking um, uh, how you found out about the author, how they found out about LeanPub and why they decided to use, use us as a, as a platform. I think it was because I've known people who have published on LeanPub. I think that was it. Cause I mean, I go to lots of events and conferences and things, and so run into a lot of people. And so I had 
anyway, some people had said, oh yeah, we, we've got this book on LeanPub. And I probably may have gotten one or two books off of there beforehand. I don't remember specifically, but um, anyway, it came on my radar and we had, there's, um, there's another service that the book was originally published on and it was a startup and um, I mean, it's still there for people who bought the book off of it, but I'm trying to steer people towards lead pump just because uh, it's, you know, I don't know, had better. I've, I've just had a better experience. We, I got a message from somebody who said, thanks for doing that. Now I can read it on my whatever device he had. And that's, that was the other thing. It's like, I've actually gone in and done the programming necessary to create a Kindle book and uh, all the different formats. And it's like, you know, I've spent months working on these things and um, got stuff working, but uh, I don't know. It, I like solving problems like that, but at some point having someone else maintaining that software I, one thing I'll say is that the limitations are definitely there. The restrictions in what I can do with, and I know you've been working on a different format, but what I, you know, it's not like everything you can do with uh, Markdown is, you know, you it's a restricted version of Markdown. But if you're willing to work within that, um, the book that we just, like the print book, we um, were able to just go directly from the lean pub to the print book. And otherwise I would have been spending weeks or months processing that. One of the advantages of the atomic format is that I was able to say, because you don't have support for um, uh, indexes, I was able to say, okay, each of these topics is just ideally just a few pages long. And so, you know, we're going to get away without an index, plus it's on an electronic format. So if you want to search for something, that's easy. Um, but the print book doesn't have an index. So um, it doing, you know, because the chapters are small, basically the table of contents is the index. You know, that's that's the hope that that, that works. Okay, we'll see how many complaints we get about not having an index. But generating an index without um, software support because, I mean, in Word, I would put in tags in the right places, and then you generate the index, and you go through it and mark it up and change your tags. And, you know, always, I would spend a couple of weeks generating the index that way. Um, so, but, you know, despite the constraints, I would say, oh, yeah, this, this has just made the process way easier. Plus, you guys do some nice promotions and, you know, you handle stuff like that. And people go there looking for books already. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased with the whole experience. Yeah, thanks for sharing all of that. Um, I can't tell you how many LeanPub authors we've spoken to who, you know, a lot of our authors are people who program and like solving their own problems and stuff like, and don't like being told what to do. Uh, and so I've, we've spoken to a lot of people who've like tried to make their own thing first before before finally, you know, kind of coming to us. But the, one of the great things about that is that we get people who've tried to tackle the problem that we're trying to solve, coming at it from all kinds of different experiences and areas. And so if, you know, insofar as LeanPub is a, is a good platform for writing and publishing and selling books it's because we've had precisely authors authors like you who've like really thought hard about like the technology behind it and how it works to produce outcomes and things like that um i should say with respect to indexes markua which is mm -hmm. our our markdown for books you know written by my colleague peter armstrong uh, is going to have index support at some point and it's mm -hmm. so that this the specification has been written like how it's going to how you as an author are going to create an index in Markua has been figured out, but it's it's just I say a matter of implementation. Uh, but you know, Markua is slowly being implemented, and eventually everything will be implemented, and we will have support for indexes, which will make a lot of authors and a lot of readers uh, very happy uh, when that finally finally happens. Um, and so you mentioned the print book, which just came out today uh, or became available today. Congratulations. Um, I've got a, I've got a question about that just for the, the other, you know, potentially self-published authors listening. Um, uh, how did you go about making a print book? So um, 
used well the bookstore that we mentioned earlier was um they had also I, oh i guess i have to go back to i have been using um it was called lightning source for so i've done two books through lightning source and then lightning source was bought by ingram and they call it ingram spark now so it's a print on demand service now lightning source used to be something where they would they would manage no they would allow you to do a press run so if you had the space to hold the books and you were shipping the books out yourself which we did with both um first steps and flex if anyone remembers flex it's pretty dead now um that's that i did with with james ward who i do the podcast with and um then atomic scala so that went and and so we ended up doing press runs but my dad was alive then and he was retired and i had him um take you know sending out all the orders and handling you know he was basically my my order department and it was nice because he didn't have enough to do and he liked he liked doing that kind of stuff and he was great to have there and i could always rely on him um but um and w what was really nice is they would they would negotiate with the printer they would they had a whole bunch of printers they would negotiate with them and then you'd have a truck you know a flatbed truck show, show up in front of your house and uh unload all these books that you put in your garage and sell them um so uh i thought that ingram did that that they would also go hey this book is getting enough that um we'll we'll do a press run but i haven't heard anything more about that i think either they're doing everything print on demand or if they decide to do a press run and warehouse the books or whatever that's um their business and they don't change your uh fees or anything of the amount that you get um the uh, there was another thing about so anyway we're using ingram spark but um my friend who i mentioned that i've known since we were 11 years old he does all my book design book cover design and so he designed the cover and did all of those things for me that's daniel will harris his name is somewhere on the cover as the cover designer so if people want to cover design they can go to him um, yeah, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Your books have great covers, and then I, I discovered that that you you um, you uh, have your friend Daniel Will Harris design them, and he's at uh, will will dash Harris dot com. If you want to find out more about him, we'll put a link in the in the transcription and everything about that. And I should also you. mention uh, the you mentioned that we talked about the bookstore, but that was before we started recording. Um, so the bookstore uh, in Crested Butte is called Towny Books, uh, right. and it's Towny uh, Towny Books. I think it's just townybooks.com. I think it's townybooks.com. I'll, I'll make sure to put a link in, in here as well. Um, in the well, there's a link. F if you want to buy it through my local, I, I suggest that you buy it through your local bookstore. But if you want to buy it through my local bookstore, there is a link that, and they'll ship it to you and everything. So, so I'm, you know, trying to support them, yeah. but I'm also hiring Arvin to do promotion for me for the, for the books. So um, nice. we'll see, Good. we'll see what happens there. Yeah. But, uh, what, when we do, like every time we do a cover, there's always this long process where I have an idea, Daniel has an idea, we try out a bunch of things, and then usually there's this moment of aha, and then the cover often comes together really quickly at that point. And we went through all kinds of different things with this cover. And finally, he just grabbed the Kotlin logo and blew it up really big. And then we put in that there's a little, it's, that's the only mid-century, because when you say atomic, you could also be talking about atomic age stuff, which is mid-century design. And the original cover that we had was um, like very mid-century. It looked like a Palm Springs sign. And, you know, it was very cool. But Svetlana had no clue about it because, I mean, she, well, like her parents were in Russia at the time and they had, you know, the, their experience was they didn't see any of this stuff. So she was just like absolutely clueless about what I was talking about. So we ended up changing it. And by the time we, that that's my experience with book covers is that you're always going through, you know, you think you, you're going to do it one way and you always end up. But by the time we were done, 
it was like we sent it to her and then she showed it around to everybody at JetBrains and they go, oh, this is awesome. You know, we they just loved it. So so it all worked out, but that's, it's always a big process. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, it's worth it because a great book cover uh, is just, I mean, a, a joy in itself to, to create and see, but also mm-hmm. really does help with sales and credibility and not that you need any of that. Uh, so the last question I always like to ask people um, if they're a Lean Pub author on this, on this podcast is if there was one thing we could fix for you or one thing we could build for you, bracketing in indexes uh, for the purposes of this conversation, can you think of anything that you would ask us to do? Well, I guess it would be nice to have a little more, um, I mean, I'm able to work within the constraints of the, um, like what I can do with uh, Markdown and and even, you know, I've studied Markua, Mark, now how do you pronounce it? Markua? Markua. Markua. Okay. I've only read it, so I pronounced it differently, but... um, I guess it would be nice to have a little more latitude in um, the way that it, the kinds of elements that I can put into the book, you know, being able to like, for example, um, when you have the um, greater than signs on the left to to have a, what do they call it? It's sort of like a call out or something. I mean, right now, all it does is just indents it. And it would be nice to be able to have some maybe stylistic control that would be a little broader. You know, it doesn't have to be everything, but it would be nice to have a few more things. Um, that, oh, and tables, at least in um, in the markdown, are kind of um, troublesome. It would be nice to, I don't know. I, like in the next book, I'm thinking of maybe just making the tables graphically using a graphics, some kind of graphics program rather than using the markdown stuff because they, they're they pretty restrictive. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, the um, uh, with respect to sort of formatting the callouts kind of or asides or blurbs or, or whatever you want to call them, we've actually just just in the last couple of weeks had a little bit of an uptick in, in, um, in uh, requests for more formatting control around those so we'll make sure oh, that I'll make okay sure so it's not just me no 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 okay um, i'll make sure to communicate to the team that that you're, yeah you're i mean there's a few things well. like that there's you know various little dingbats and stuff that might be nice to have slightly more control over yeah. but that one in particular i think it would have been nice to yeah. have yeah. um been able to do nicer call outs yeah and when it comes to tables um we we we're, we've like we've done a, a fair amount of improving to them like uh, already uh in the last few months uh mm-hmm. in response to, to requests from authors but there is a certain level beyond which something like Markua is probably never going to go when it comes to detailed formatting control and so actually quite a few lean pub authors just go you know what i've got some other you know app or software or process or whatever for making my tables exactly as i like them and then they put them in as an image um and and that seems to work you know really well it took me this long to th- to kind of like doy, you know, have that, <laughs> have that as like, cause I'm trying to make everything work within the, the markdown table format. And, and well, especially if the table has like a paragraph of text in it, that all has to be a single line. And I had to write a program to do that and everything. And now I'm looking at it going, oh, I could have tables look exactly the way I, or any graphics. And, and it, if you had, I guess, to recommend that somewhere in your table section, say, hey, this is limited. If you want to do more, and then maybe even recommend some, because I'm not sure what program I would go looking for at this point that could make nice tables. Yeah, you know that what we what we need, what we really need is a, a help center article about how to make tables um, with an example that you can copy and paste, uh, mm-hmm. and um, and and an explanation of because we we try to do this in our help center articles where we can or on the authors forum when people create threads about things we always do try and say you know what's our what's our recommended workflow and that doesn't always mean only use lean pub stuff like it mm-hmm. a lot of the time we're telling people like you know we, we built a whole workflow called bring your own book which means like you know if you want to if you want to use all of our storefront type stuff and community type stuff uh you know and be part of our author community you can do all that and you don't have to use you know Markua at all 
to create, mm-hmm. to create your eBooks, but you can still, still come to lean pub. Uh, that well, does remind me of one more thing, which is in your, um, your help system, your articles will say things like over a week old, that is useless. Just if you're going to do that, remove it, you know, put a real date on it or don't say that. <laughs> Cause that's just like, ah, so frustrating. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, uh-huh. We use a service that we really like called intercom. I haven't been able to find a setting to turn, to change that or turn that off. Okay. I, I have spent lots of time shouting at the computer when information is hidden. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a huge enemy of the day, a, a day ago, a week ago, a month ago. Yeah. Uh, I just it's, tell me when it was, mm-hmm. um, uh, and you know don't hide the email address anymore. Gmail, uh, you know things like that. Like I just you know it's mm-hmm. it's, it's that, frustrating. That, yeah. Anyway, I couldn't agree with you more. Mm-hmm. That, every time I look at that, I'm like, I wish I could turn that <laughs> it's off. It's like a little dig. Yeah, yeah. If anyone knows how to change that or turn that off in it, mm-hmm. articles, please let me know. But art, but by the way, Intercom's a wonderful, wonderful service, and we love them very much. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, well, Bruce, thank you very much for taking the time to do this interview today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, using LeanPub to publish a couple of your books. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks. And thanks, as always, to all of you for listening to this episode of the Front Matter Podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate and review it wherever you found it. And if you'd like to be a LeanPub author yourself, please check out our website at leanpub.com. Thanks.